I honestly don't even know where to start. So, um, A, thank you for taking the time. Like, what is your sleep schedule like? Oh God, it's weird. So right now we are on Mars time. We'll be on Mars time for probably the first like three months of the mission. Um, because Mars, it, it takes longer for a day to happen on Mars. It's, it's about 24 hours and 40 something minutes, I think. So the days are about 40 minutes longer than they are on Earth. And to make sure that we are sending up commands, letting it drive around, take pictures, do everything during the day, bring that data back to us, and then it sleeps at night, to be able to maintain that schedule for the rover, we need to be on that Mars schedule as well. And so I work on the downlink side. So I think my shifts start around like 3 p.m. Mars time every day, which means I'm supposed to wake up at, I don't know, 12, 1, 1 p.m. Mars time. And that changes every single day. So today I will be going in for my shift around I think I'll leave at like 3.30 p.m. and I'll probably be getting home around around like 2 a.m. Uh, so it's 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 a little crazy. It's you're basically moving a time zone every single day. How surreal is this? I mean, did you grow up thinking that you would be part of of a mission to Mars? Never. I I'll be honest, I was never the space kid. I was, I liked math and science. I definitely developed like a, a strong love for STEM early on. And I knew I wanted to be an engineer, like starting in middle school, I think, but I was never the kid going to space camp or robotics club. I was busy, you know, on sports teams, playing soccer and lacrosse and student council, after school jobs and by the time I got to college and I got really interested in space and I was like, wow, this stuff is so cool. Like, I didn't even know we were doing all of this. Like, I want to work for NASA and that was my dream. But I thought my dream came too late. Like, I saw everyone else getting internships and they were, you know, space kids. They were always in it. And I thought that my interest just peaked a little too late. And so I almost gave up. I had been applying to NASA internships, but I was like, they're not, they don't want me. I'm not the candidate that they're looking for. They want someone who's better on paper. And um, I ended up watching the movie Hidden Figures. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's after watching that and seeing those women just defy the odds and, and you know, follow their dreams, even if people didn't think that they were the right people for the job. Um, that definitely inspired me. And I was like, okay, no, I can't, I can't give up this easily. I got to keep applying. And I got an internship and the internship led to a job. And it, it made me really happy to know that you can, your dreams can change later in life. Like it doesn't have to be something that you want. When I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a lion tamer and a ballerina. And uh, clearly that's not what I'm doing. So talk to me about your role at NASA. What exactly is your, your job title and um, what, uh, what is your role with Mars 2020 Perseverance? So the overall umbrella term for my job, I'm a systems engineer. Uh, I got my degree from Georgia Tech in mechanical engineering, but now I do systems engineering. So I work with, with an entire flight system, the the software, the hardware, how it interacts to make the rover do what it needs to do on the surface. We command the vehicle, we give it a whole bundle of sequences and we say, here you go, do this today. And the rover will go through those sequences so it can autonomously control itself. It, it'll, you know, right now we're in more of like a checkout phase because we just got started. We wanna make sure everything's working properly. We want to just do a couple different tests, then we'll be able to start driving and, and doing science. And I mean, we've already started taking so many pictures um, and it needs to be able to do that on its own. So we send up the commands, it drives around, does its thing. And when uh, different orbiters that are going around Mars, when they get over top of the, uh, Perseverance, she takes all the data that she's been storing and she sends it up to the orbiter. 
and then uh, the orbiter will send it back to Earth via the Deep Space Network. And uh, then that data comes down to where I am and I can look at that data and see how it, like, what's going on with it. What kind of pressure is riding on your shoulder and that of your team members? I'll be honest, there's a lot of um, imposter syndrome. That's something that I know a lot of young engineers face. And I mean, not just engineers, people in any industry feel it where you see the things that you're doing, you see the incredible people that you work with and you say, are, did they hire, like, why did they hire me? Am I really supposed to be doing this? Am I, am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Like this stuff is so important and millions of people are watching what we're doing and, and I'm the person sitting behind the chair. Like I, I can't even remember what I had for dinner last night. Like, how am I supposed to, why do they trust me? Um, so it definitely, like you get hard on yourself, but the people that I work with, not only are they like geniuses, but they are so supportive. They are so helpful. You're never doing something by yourself. Even if you are someone who is tasked with, like you are in charge of this one activity, there are so many people who are helping you out, making sure that, you know, you're doing the right thing. And if you need any assistance, they are, they are there, whether it's advice or their time or I'm never doing any of this by myself. Um, so, so what have you been most impressed with so far that you've seen? It's got to be the videos. I don't know if you've seen the videos, but oh my God, something that they developed just for Mars 2020, there was a whole team developed uh just like devoted to those uh edl cameras and that is probably the coolest part of the mission seeing something land on another planet as as crazy as the sky crane maneuver is being able to see a video of it <sighs> amazing so walk me through real quick what 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 specifically are you looking for so we have several uh mission objectives one of them is to look for signs of past life. And we have many science instruments that are devoted to doing that. And the reason why uh, we landed in Jezero Crater is because we believe it's an ancient uh, lake bed. And we're specifically right by uh, a river delta. So if there was any sediment in those ancient rivers that would have contained any signs of past life, it would have been deposited in that delta. So we're hoping to be able to find things right there. We also are preparing for human exploration. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through technology demonstrations, such as MOXIE. That's our instrument that can convert Martian CO2 in the atmosphere to oxygen, which is not only important for humans to be able to breathe on Mars, but oxygen is crucial if we want astronauts to be able to leave Mars, we need that for our rocket fuel. Um, so MOXIE, that's, that's a cool objective that we have. And one of the other things that is really cool about Mars 2020 is our sample caching. So the Curiosity rover had a robotic arm. It could drill, it could uh, look at samples, it could do science on them. But with the Perseverance robotic arm, we can drill, do samples, and then we can store those samples if we think it's like extra cool. We put it in a sample tube. And then there's a, a whole system inside the rover that can take those samples, cache them, and eventually we will put those samples on the ground somewhere. And a future mission, Mars Sample Return, which we'll be doing with the European Space Agency, we'll be able to go pick them up, send them back home, and then that will give us a much better, you know, situation to be able to look at, like we can only do so much science on Mars. If we could get those samples back to our laboratories here, that's like a scientist's dream. Walk me through that moment when it, when it landed. And I mean, we've, we've all seen the videos of everybody erupting and cheer from, from, you know, control central there. So walk me through that. What was that like for you? So I was actually, in our system test bed uh, while we were doing it. When we did launch and when we did landing, the test bed was configured to shadow. 
the real vehicle. So if anything happens during one of those mission critical events, they have a, a, a stunt double here on Earth that we can test on. And so we were shadowing entry, descent, and landing for the entire week. And we ended up jumping ahead of them, landing the test bed like early Thursday morning successfully, which is good because, you know, we could have crashed, but we didn't. Um, and then the test bed was automatically configured to surface mode, just like the real thing was, but we had to stay with it just in case they needed to use it for debug afterwards. So I was in there, which is fitting because I have spent so many hours testing in that, in that room. Uh, so it was poetic that I got to be in there for landing. And my coworker, Julia and I, we were listening to mission control, were connected to them through our headsets and we had the visualization up on a big screen and we had access to the telecom team. Um, we could see like all of their plots. So we have, it was like st stimulation overload. And, and when we were listening, we knew the different call points that had to happen before they could declare touchdown. So we're hearing it as it's going, we're like, oh my God, check, check, check. And all of a sudden Swathi Mohan says, touchdown confirmed and tears. I just burst into tears. I was jumping up and down. Let's just talk about your time in Westchester for a bit. Um, first of all, I just need to note, I see the pillow on your bed, repping Westchester 19380. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. it. And repping Philly as well. That's fantastic. So you are a 2014 graduate of East, correct? 2015. 2015. I apologize. Okay. 2015. And um, so t just tell me about your time and what, did you go through Westchester schools K to 12? Yes, uh, I went to Exton Elementary and then Fugate Middle School and then East High School. So pipeline whole, whole way through. I am very, very fortunate to have grown up where I grew up in an area with such amazing public schools and gave me the opportunity to have some really awesome teachers that helped me out. Um, I was extremely fortunate that I was in the gifted program throughout my time in school. So I had access to amazing resources and some really great, really great teachers that helped me prepare for college and figure out what I wanted to do. Now, do you keep in touch with any of your former teachers like from East or, or any? I do. I do. I'm, I'm Facebook friends with a couple of them. So I got, um, I got a couple shout outs after landing and I thought that was really sweet. I, I think it's, I mean, teachers have so many students, especially when they're teaching for so many years and to know that some of them are still watching what I'm doing and, and still supporting me, that, that really means a lot. Do you have any, any favorite memories of Westchester that come to mind? We actually went back to Exton Elementary uh, right after we graduated college and we wore our college t-shirts and our caps and gowns and we were just outside and Exton had gotten, Exton got a facelift since, since we were, you know, in school there. So it looked a little different, but, um, the sign outside was still the same sign. So we took a picture with that. And then we actually, it was after hours, um, and so, all, you know, we couldn't get in or anything, but there was a man from the district who was just happened to be there. And he saw us all in our, you know, at times like, oh, do you guys want to go inside? And so he took us inside and showed us, you know, all the new hallways and classrooms. But one thing that had stayed the same was the courtyard uh, garden in the middle of the school. And there was this tree. It's a metal tree with glass leaves. And that tree, it was all, it was my fourth grade class who, who made it. And so we were all standing there looking for our leaves. Um, and I found, I could always remember which one mine was. So that was a really cool memory it was, you know, going back in time a little bit. We're going to share this out, uh, this video with our community. So what would you say to, you know, the, the, the fee, well, all students, but specifically the young females that are coming up through the Westchester Area School District that, that may either have that dream of, of being a scientist and an engineer or an astronaut or, what, or a lion tamer or a ballerina. What would you say to the young students here in Westchester Area School District that are watching this? 
would have to say never be afraid that you aren't qualified. Never be afraid that you know, you're not good enough. You're not the type of candidate that someone is looking for. You're not the right person for the job because you are. If, if you really want to do this job, do not give up trying to do that job. Do not give up on that dream. Do not give up on that passion. Like we are told that only certain people can do certain jobs and you have to look a certain way to be able to, to do this because you know it's only ever been people who look like this. And, and that's not true. People are breaking down those stereotypes, breaking down those barriers every single day. And I'm very proud to be able to work with an extremely diverse, amazing group of, of engineers. And I think that it's really important that if you really want to do something, don't, don't give up.